Welcome to N3 Primetime. I'm Angie, and tonight Gary's got a lineup of stories that'll keep you on the edge of your seat. First up, Gary exposes the blatant media bias in the border crisis. See how major networks are turning a blind eye to the severity of the situation and the Republican criticism of President Biden. Next, we'll delve into Maine's controversial decision to disqualify former President Trump from the ballot. It's a legal and political drama you can't miss. Then Gary takes us through Donald Trump Jr.'s explosive podcast episode, a raw take on America's challenges that's shaking up the mainstream narrative. But wait, there's more. Get ready to relive the spirit of 2016 with President Trump's latest video. It's a three-minute patriotic power surge that's reigniting the nation. And in Ventura, California, a rogue waves political spin is making waves. We'll cut through the noise and bring you the real story behind this natural disaster. Plus, don't miss our comment section segment where we dive into your thoughts and opinions. And in looking at you, we spotlight a mover and shaker causing a stir. So stay tuned and let's get ready to tackle these stories head on. Over to you, Gary. Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of N3 Primetime, our last episode of 2023. Tonight we're diving into stories that hit at the heart what it means to be an American, from the media's glaring bias and reporting the border crisis to Maine's contentious political maneuver against former President Trump. These stories aren't just news items, they're a reflection of our nation's current state and the battles we face. We'll also explore the unfiltered words of Donald Trump Jr. in his podcast, a raw depiction of our country's challenges in President Trump's latest video, a potent reminder of the patriotism that defines us. Plus, we're dissecting the rogue wave incident in Ventura, California, and how it's being twisted for political gain. And speaking of twists and turns, let's talk about gold. Just like our stories tonight, gold's value is a telling sign of our times. Think about it. Gold, soaring past $2,000 an ounce, reminiscent of the 1970s turmoil with the Iran hostage crisis and stagflation, when gold leaped from $158 to $850 an ounce. Today, as our national debt skyrockets, gold value mirrors the uncertainty we're witnessing. It's a stark reminder, as Donald Trump said, of the potential downfall of the U.S. dollar losses in its world standard. Now, in times like these, the Patriot Gold Group offers a secure path. Imagine your IRA or 401k backed by physical gold and silver, reflecting the enduring strength of these metals in turbulent times. Call the Patriot Gold Group. The number's on the screen, 888-857-9437, and mention Next News for top-notch service. Remember, gold isn't just a metal, it's a measure of our national pulse. Angie, back to you. What stories do you have lined up for us tonight? Tonight's lineup is sizzling with stories you can't afford to miss. First up, Elon Musk is stirring the pot again. This time it's about a supposed robot attack at his Texas factory. Musk is slamming the media for exaggerating, but there's more to this story than meets the eye. Then Seattle's BLM Memorial Garden, once a symbol of protest, now gone. Why did the city remove it and what's next? You'll want to hear this. Also, Nikki Haley is facing tough questions about her stance on Trump. A young questionnaire didn't hold back, likening her to John Kerry. It's a glimpse into the GOP's inner turmoil. And there's more. The House Ethics Committee is investigating Representative Sheila Sherfillis McCormick for possible violations. We're diving deep into what this means for political transparency. Finally, Elon Musk versus Disney. Musk has pulled the Disney Plus app from his Tesla vehicles. Is this a battle for free speech or something else? Stay tuned as Gary takes over with our first special report of the night. Over to you, Gary. Tonight we're tearing the mask off the media's disgraceful bias. Imagine a crisis so severe that even the staunchest supporters can't ignore it. That's what's happening at our border. But here's the twist. While the media finally admits there's a crisis, they're playing a dangerous game of selective hearing. They're tuning out key voices, voices that challenge the narrative they're comfortably settled into under the Biden administration. It's a story of double standards, of silence, criticism, and of a media landscape that's lost its compass. So why are they ignoring the Republican outcry? And what are they afraid that you'll hear? By the end of this report, you'll see the full picture they don't want you to see. And trust me, you don't want to miss my final thought. It's going to tie everything together in a way that matters to every American. Now, before we dive deeper, let's take a moment, just like we bring you the unfiltered truth. Our sponsor, Tipsy Tabby Publishing, brings you unparalleled adventure to your gaming table. Picture this, the border crisis is a complex game and navigating it requires skill and insight. Tipsy Tabby offers that edge in your role-playing game world. With their Pathfinder series and Dungeons and Dragon resources like 
next level toxicology, and magical miscellany, you're enhancing gameplay with innovative ideas. Think of it as strategizing for the challenges at our borders. Visit them at drivethroughrpg.com or tipsytabbypublishing.com. Your next epic gaming session mirroring the complexities of real-world challenges awaits. The link's in the description. Now, back to our report. In today's media landscape, the truth often gets lost in a sea of bias and selective reporting. This is glaringly evident in the coverage of the ongoing border crisis. And under the Trump administration, every move was scrutinized, every decision a headline. But now under Biden, there's a stark contrast in how the media is handling similar issues. So let's break it all down. Firstly, the term illegal has almost vanished from the media's vocabulary. The left has triumphantly shifted the narrative to migrants needing processing. This seismic shift isn't just about words. It's about framing the entire issue in a way that aligns with their agenda. The crisis at the border isn't new, but it's the way it's being reported that certainly is. Now, in a recent development, top Biden officials met with the Mexican president to discuss the crisis. This meeting came as Democrat mayors from major cities raised alarms about the federal government's inadequate support in handling the influx of migrants. The media's coverage? Predictably one-sided. The word illegal is carefully avoided, and the focus is on challenges faced by these cities, not the policies that led us here. Now, let's talk about the missing piece, Republican criticism. It's as if GOP voices have been muted. The only opinions you'll hear from are the Democrats or the migrants themselves. For instance, CBS Mornings brought in John Sandway, a former acting ICE director under Obama, as an expert. But they conveniently left out his political affiliations. This omission is a subtle yet powerful way to sway public perception, presenting a biased viewpoint as a neutral analysis. See for yourself. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Mexico's president yesterday. Christina Ruffini has more from Washington. Christina, good morning. Let me ask you, are there any signs of progress? Good morning, Vlad. Well, following the meeting, a senior administration official said progress is being made, but that this isn't a problem the U.S. and Mexico can solve on their own, and that most of this meeting focused on work the two can do in the region together. Migrant crossings are multiplying at the southern border, reaching record levels. How to address it was why the secretaries of state and Homeland Security traveled to Mexico Wednesday for more than two hours of talks with President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. The Biden administration wants Mexico to do more to stop migrants before they get to the U.S. And Mexico wants the U.S. to help address root causes, including poverty and violence in Latin American nations. If Mexico cut off cooperation tomorrow, we'd be, in, we'd be in deep trouble in the United States. John Sandweg is the former acting director of U.S. Immigration and Customs. And I think the U.S. is pitching that this is a regional problem, not just a United States problem, that we need to work together on this and that there are investments that we're prepared to make either in Mexico and in Latin America to help solve this crisis. But more may need to be done as a new caravan of an estimated 8,000 men, women and children are heading north through Mexico to the U.S. We want help, says his mother from Venezuela, and an education for our children. And while border communities are bearing the brunt, the impact of the immigration influx is straining resources across the country. We expect the surge to intensify in the coming days New York has received about 100,000 migrants in the last year, many of them bused there by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. And yesterday, New York City Mayor Eric Adams joined fellow Democratic mayors from Chicago and Denver to ask Washington for help. The federal government must take responsibility and lead on this humanitarian crisis instead of leaving it for cities and localities to handle. Of course, it's going to be hard for those cities to get the help they say they need because Congress has still not approved border security funding, part of a larger package that's on their desk waiting for them when they come back to work in January. Michelle. Now, in the clip you just saw, CBS skews the narrative. No mention of Republican concerns, just a one-sided view. It's a pattern repeated across major networks. ABC's Good Morning America, for instance, took it a step further they framed Texas Governor Greg Abbott's decision to bus migrants to so-called sanctuary cities as cruel and inhuman. The irony? These cities probably declare themselves sanctuaries for illegal immigrants, yet, when faced with the reality of their policies, they cry foul. Watch. 
Good morning, Wood. So this is the Port Authority in Manhattan. This is where these buses are now required to drop off the migrants at specific times with specific notice. But the mayor here and several other leaders of really prominent cities say they need substantial federal help as this problem keeps growing. December's now on track to have the highest number of Border Patrol apprehensions ever, according to Customs and Border Protection data. The agency reporting on average nearly 10,000 apprehensions a day over the last week. And this morning, a trio of mayors from New York City, Chicago, and Denver are all calling for federal support responding to the national immigration crisis. Accusing Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott of cruel and inhumane politics, busing migrants across the country. We're looking at about $160 million of potential costs going to next year's budget. That's almost 10% of our entire city budget. New York City's mayor issuing an executive order requiring advance notice for buses dropping off migrants in the city, now only allowing their arrival weekday mornings between 8.30 and noon. This, as officials Wednesday, shuttled hundreds of people to overcrowded shelters throughout the city. To be clear, this is not stopping people from coming but about ensuring the safety of migrants and making sure they can arrive in a coordinated and orderly way. The mayor's office says more than 7,000 asylum seekers have arrived in New York City in just the last two weeks. Earlier this week, hundreds of asylum seekers were flown to the Northeast, forced to stop in Philadelphia due to bad weather. On Wednesday, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visiting Mexico, meeting with the president there to discuss the historic levels of migration. A source familiar with the talk says the U.S. is hoping to find ways to convince Mexico to do more, to ramp up immigration enforcement on its side of the border and discuss incentives to encourage people to stay in Mexico rather than cross into the U.S. The talks come as another large caravan of thousands of people slowly advances north through Mexico headed toward the southern border. The leaders of the group reportedly made up of people fleeing Central America or carrying banners which read Exodus from Poverty. As you just witnessed, ABC's coverage is not just biased, it's hypocritical. They describe illegal aliens, as, Ill illegal aliens as asylum seekers and completely ignore the Republican perspective. This isn't just about differing viewpoints, it's about a deliberate suppression of any narrative that doesn't align with their agenda. Now, the media's portrayal of this border showdown is misleading. It's not a showdown between Democrats and Republicans, as they would have you believe. It's a crisis that affects every American, yet the full story isn't being told. The media's failure to present a balanced view to include Republican criticism is a disservice to the public. Let's delve into the consequences of this biased reporting. By silencing Republican voices, the media is effectively shaping public opinion to favor one side. This isn't just about immigration, it's about the integrity of our republic. When the media picks sides, democracy suffers. We rely on the press to hold all sides accountable, not just the ones they disagree with. The situation at the border is complex and there are no easy solutions, but one thing is clear, the media's role in this crisis is problematic. Their coverage, or lack thereof, of Republican criticism, their choice of language, and their framing of the issue all contribute to a narrative that is far from the truth. This is not just about politics, it's about the principles our republic stands on. The media has a responsibility to report the facts, to present all sides of the story. But what we're seeing is a deliberate attempt to shape the narrative to fit a particular political agenda. As we continue to navigate this crisis, it's crucial to stay informed and seek out multiple perspectives. The truth often lies somewhere in the middle, but you wouldn't know that from watching the mainstream media. It's time for the media to remember their duty to the public and start reporting the whole story, not just the parts that fit their narrative. If you got value from this report, tap subscribe. And now, my final thought. So tonight, we've peeled back the layers of media bias to reveal a troubling reality. The mainstream media isn't just reporting news, they're running cover for Joe Biden's disastrous policies. They've become accomplices in the crimes against America, aiding and abetting illegal immigration at the behest of their global masters. This isn't just about bias reporting, it's about an orchestrated effort to subject America to a global order where our cherished freedoms are at risk and the Constitution is sidelined. As Americans, we must recognize this threat. The media's role in shaping public opinion and policy is immense. And when they choose to serve an agenda rather than the truth, our republic is in peril. We must demand accountability and transparency, not just from our leaders, but from those who report on them. 
Remember, when the media abandons its duty to be fair and impartial, it's not just journalism that suffers, it's our entire nation. Now, Angie, over to you for the latest on Elon Musk's response to that 2021 robot incident at Tesla's Giga Texas factory. In today's twist of events, Elon Musk, the ever controversial CEO of Tesla, is back in the headlines. This time it's over a supposed robot attack at the Giga Texas factory back in 2021. Reports claimed a Tesla engineer was viciously assaulted by a robot. But Musk, in his typical fashion, calls out the media for blowing things out of proportion. He clarifies it wasn't one of those fancy humanoid Optimus robots, just a regular industrial robot. According to Musk, it's truly shameful how the media is digging up old stories. The engineer apparently thought the robot was off, a costly mistake. Amidst this, Musk still finds time to lament about cancel culture. And oh, he also lost the mere $5.9 billion in a day. But don't worry, he's still the richest man alive. Want more juicy details? Get the whole story. Tap the link on our channel. Gary, you are up next with an in-depth analysis of Secretary of State Shayna Bellow's controversial decision to exclude Trump from Maine's ballot. Welcome to our special report. Tonight we're delving into a story that's shaking the foundations of our republic. Picture this. A lone state official, Maine's Secretary of State, Shayna Bellows, takes a stand that could alter the course of American politics. She's barred former President Trump from the Maine ballot when the mainstream media is hailing her as a hero. But wait, there's more to the story than meets the eye. The fine print in her ruling, the legal intricacies, and the uproar it's caused. We're unpacking it all. And this isn't just about one candidate or one state. It's a narrative that challenges the very essence of our, of our electoral process. And trust me, you don't want to miss my final thought on this. It's a perspective that cuts the noise and speaks directly to the heart of what it means to be an American voter. Now, before we dive deeper into tonight's report, let's take a moment, just like how our trustworthy reporting is made possible by our sponsors, the stability of our nation's political landscape is foundational. And speaking of foundations, let's talk gold. With wars, economic uncertainties, and looming rate cuts, gold has soared past 2,000 an ounce. It's reminiscent of the 1970s turmoil, war crisis, financial instability, just like we're witnessing today. Our national debt skyrocketing, and there's a direct correlation to the price of gold. Remember, in times of political and economic uncertainty, gold remains a steadfast protector of value. So call the Patriot Gold Group, the number's on the screen, and mention Next News for top-rated service. Gold isn't just a metal, it's a safeguard for your future. Write that number down, 888-857-9437, and mention Next News. Now, in a move that sent shockwaves through the political landscape, Maine's Secretary of State has made a decision that could be a game changer in American politics. She has disqualified former President Donald Trump from appearing on Maine's primary ballot. But it's not just the action itself that's stirring controversy. It's the way it was done, the reasons behind it, and the reaction it elicited. Now let's start at the beginning. Bellows, a Democrat, based her decision on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, citing Trump's alleged role in the January 6th Capitol incident. This is unprecedented. No Secretary of State has ever used this section to bar a presidential candidate from the ballot. And Bellow's rationale hinges on a narrative of election fraud and claims that Trump incited violence. But let's take a look closer. The image here shows the letter from Trump's lawyers demanding Bellow's recusal, citing her past statements about January 6. It's a crucial piece of this puzzle. Bellow's own words on social media indicate a predetermined stance on Trump, suggesting a lack of impartiality in her decision-making process. And then there is the fine print. On CNN, Bello stated that she'd suspend her decision if the U.S. Supreme Court rules Trump can be on the ballot. Did you hear me? She's playing a waiting game, a move that's both strategic and telling. It reveals the uncertainty and possibility of the political motivation behind her decision. In this clip, you'll hear Bellows herself discussing the suspension of her ruling. It's a rare glimpse in the political maneuvering at play. Watch. I think it's really important that people understand the process. Uh, as a general matter, states uh, have the power to control their own ballots and in fact do under the Constitution. And Maine law specifically delegates to me as Secretary of State a requirement to review the qualifications for any candidate running for office. So for example, uh, last week, the Superior Court found that my decision to bar Mr. Chris Christie from Maine's presidential primary ballot due to lack of signatures was lawful and correct. So my job 
I qualify Mr. Trump for the ballot. Uh, and under Maine law, any registered voter can bring a challenge to that qualification. In this case, there were three challenges, and I was required by law to hold a hearing, an administrative hearing, to review the evidence, hear testimony. Uh, both sides were represented by counsel. Mr. Trump was represented by an attorney, and then I'm required to issue a decision. That's my obligation under the oath I swore to the Constitution. I reviewed Section 3 of the 14th Amendment very carefully and determined that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does not say conviction, it says engage. And let's go back and keep in mind that the events of January 6, 2021 were unprecedented and tragic. This was an attack not only on the Capitol and the government officials, the former Vice President, members of Congress, but an attack on the rule of law. And the weight of evidence that I reviewed indicated uh, that it was in fact an insurrection and Mr. Trump engaged in that insurrection under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I will always implement what the court decides and this type of proceeding is not unusual as part of my duties in Maine under Maine election law, but I will always uphold what the court does and it's part of the job of being Secretary of State. Uh, should the U.S. Supreme Court rule that Mr. Trump be on the ballot, I will in fact place him on the ballot. It's part of why I suspended the effect of my decision until the courts can act. Uh, so no ballots are being printed until that Superior Court uh, decision or Supreme Court decision uh, might come down. Uh, although we're looking at a very tight time frame. She said it right there. Now let's talk about the media's role. CNN and MSNBC were quick to spotlight Bellows framing her decision as brave and groundbreaking. It's no secret that these networks have been critical of Trump, but their coverage of the incident has been particularly glowing. Bellows even boasted on MSNBC about Maine's voter participation rate, linking it to her decision. Watch this MSNBC clip where Bellows justifies her decision, and you'll see the narrative that's being spun. Watch. It's a very detailed decision. Uh, we lay out uh, why under Maine law, the Secretary of State has the authority, indeed the obligation, I'm duty bound to make this determination. Uh, we also, I rather, um, laid out that the record demonstrates that in fact, the events of January 6, 2021, which were unprecedented and tragic, uh, were an insurrection uh, in the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And finally, uh, in reviewing the facts presented, the evidence, uh, the law, the history, um, we determined uh, under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment that Mr. Trump engaged in insurrection and therefore was disqualified. Now, I, I, I have to say, not only is this an incredibly important decision, but it's a very brave decision. Uh, the Trump campaign has, has already come out attacking you. Uh, they have said that you are a, a virulent leftist and a hyper-partisan Biden-supporting Democrat. First and foremost, it's important to know, my oath to the Constitution, my obligations to the Constitution and rule of law come before any other consideration. No other factors could weigh on that decision and did not. I'm duty-bound to both hold a hearing and make a ruling. And under the law, there's a very compressed timeline uh, in evaluating this. Uh, I came to the conclusion that I could not, unfortunately or fortunately, wait for the United States Supreme Court to make a de decision. Uh, the main law required me to issue that decision, which I did today. I smile because we were number one in voter turnout per capita in 2022. We are really proud of that. And we have a really strong framework of election laws that encourage citizen participation. Uh, we have same day voter registration. We have no excuse absentee voting up to 30 days prior to election day. Uh, we uh, make it really easy to register to vote, to cast your ballot and know your ballot will be counted. And we're really proud of our national leadership in voter participation and citizen engagement in elections and in the democratic process. Oh, it's like a super Karen over there. However, this isn't just about media bias or political maneuvering. There's a deeper issue here, the undermining of our rights. By unilaterally deciding to remove Trump from the ballot, Bellows has effectively disenfranchised hundreds of thousands of Republican voters in Maine. This sets a dangerous precedent. If a single state official 
can determine a candidate's eligibility based on subjective interpretations of their actions, where does it end? Now take a look at this clip of Bellows on Anderson Cooper 360. Her words, her demeanor, it all speaks volumes. Watch. Again, I am so mindful, and I, I said this in my decision, uh, that it is unprecedented. No Secretary of State has ever deprived a presidential candidate of ballot access based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, but no presidential candidate has ever engaged in insurrection and been disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But there's more. CNN's own senior legal analyst, Ellie Honig, pointed out the shaky legal grounds of Bellow's decision, noting it was based on YouTube clips and news reports, materials that wouldn't hold up in a regular court. And Bellows isn't even a lawyer, which raises questions about her legal acumen in interpreting the Constitution and making such a significant decision. Watch him dissect Bellows' ruling in this clip. Watch. Is, were the processes, were these hearings fair? Did they comport with due process? And I think there's a question there with regard to what Maine did. Because if you look at the hearing, and she details this in the, in the ruling, they heard from one fact witness, a law professor. She based her ruling on a lot of documents but also YouTube clips, news reports, things that would never pass the bar in normal court. She's not a lawyer, by the way. It's a smartly written decision, clearly consulted with lawyers, but this is an unelected, she's chosen by the state legislature. She's elected by the chosen state legislature. Uh, chosen, elected by the legislature, but not democratically elected, not a knock. That's just the way it's set up in Maine. And this hearing, look, it doesn't have to be a criminal trial. We don't have to have all the protections. But I think the argument you'll hear from opponents is, one, not up to the states to do this. This is why we have all different decisions from all different states. And two, the procedures were not up to snuff. The broader implications are startling. Maine is now the second state after Colorado to bar Trump based on 14th Amendment claims. It's a move that could ripple across the nation, affecting future elections and the very core of our democratic process. Now here, Pelos Bo Bellows' post on the platform now known as X, previously Twitter, underscores her stance on the January 6th event, revealing a perspective that could be seen as biased. But let's hear from the other side. Vivek Ramaswamy, a Republican presidential contender, called Bellow's decision a threat to democracy. Take a look at Ramaswamy's reaction here. It's a clear indicator of the widespread concern and frustration. Watch. Vivek, the secretaries of states in 2020, secretaries of states, one individual, would come in and wipe away the laws of the legislature and say, because of COVID, I'm changing mail-in balloting. One person changing election rules. That was 2020. 2024, one person saying, I am disenfranchising Trump voters. Your thoughts? Well, look, Kaylee, I think you phrased it well, but I would say that this is not an action of one person. This is the action of an entire system that has an anaphylactic reaction to one man. And I think they're dropping the bed breadcrumbs. They're making it clearer by the day. I'm concerned that they will not allow this man to get anywhere near the start line of the election, let alone the finish line. And I say this as somebody who's running in the same race as Donald Trump. This is not how we should want to win. So I stand by the pledge I made earlier on the back of the Colorado decision, and I reiterate it today, that I will voluntarily, as a Republican candidate, remove myself from any GOP primary ballot where one of my competitors, Donald Trump included, is forcibly removed through this unconstitutional maneuver. And I think one thing that the other Republican candidates can do, Kaylee, is to fight against this, to say that Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Chris Christie do the same thing, that if Maine is going to do this, we then take Maine out of the GOP primary process. That's the logical way to handle this. And so I made that announcement tonight. I challenge every one of my other competitors in the GOP primary to do the same thing to say that we will not stand by idly and watch this brazen form of election interference in the GOP primary itself. And I think that that's not a left-wing or a right-wing issue. It shouldn't be. This is about the Constitution and who we are as Americans. And that's why I've taken the position I have. And he's not alone in this sentiment. Governor Ron DeSantis questioned whether this sets a precedent for disqualifying candidates based on arbitrary criteria. In this clip, DeSantis raises vital questions about the implications of Bellow's decision. Watch this. Here to weigh in live from the campaign trail in Iowa, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Governor, you just heard this news like we did. What's your reaction? Well, the idea that one bureaucrat in an executive position can simply unilaterally 
disqualify someone from office, that turns on its head every notion of constitutional due process that this country has always abided by for over 200 years. Uh, it opens up Pandora's box. Can you have a Republican secretary of state uh, disqualify Biden from the ballot because he's let in eight million people illegally, a massive invasion, including uh, from enemies of our country. Uh, places like Iran, China, Middle East have poured in with his knowledge and assent, basically. Uh, so it really opens up Pandora's box. I don't think that this ultimately will be legally sustained uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court. But I do think that this is going to be a constant throughout the election year where there's going to be different parts of these legal cases uh, that are going to be front and center. Uh, I think that we win uh, when we hold Biden accountable and talk about the issues that matter to the American people. So I think the Democrats, they want the election to be about uh, all these other issues. They do not want to face accountability for their failed policies. And then there is the legal perspective. The U.S. Supreme Court will ultimately decide this issue, but the fact that it's reached this level is troubling in itself. It reflects a growing trend where political battles are increasingly fought in the courts, further polarizing an already divided nation. The reality is Maine's four electoral votes are crucial. In 2020, Trump won one of Maine's electors and disqualifying him based on controversial interpretation of the 14th Amendment not only impacts Trump, but also sets a precedent for how future candidates could be treated. As we delve into the complex issue, let's not forget the big picture. This isn't just about Trump or Maine. It's about the integrity of our electoral process and the principles of our republic. And here in the fine print, Bellows admits she is waiting for the Supreme Court's decision. This image on your screen shows her acknowledging the conditional nature of her ruling. That says it all. I will suspend the effect of my decision until the Superior Court rules on any appeal or the time to appeal under the section until it's expired. There you have it, friends. If you got value from this report, tap subscribe. Don't miss what's coming up next. My final thoughts. Now, as we wrap up tonight's report, let's focus on the crux of the matter. The fine print in her ruling. It's here where the truth lies, almost hidden but glaringly significant. Bellows knows her decision to disqualify Trump from the main ballots on shaky ground, and that's why she suspended it pending the Supreme Court's verdict. It's an admission, albeit a subtle one, that her action may not withstand legal scrutiny. This fine print is a telling sign. It reveals a lack of conviction in her own ruling, an uncertainty that speaks volumes. It's an acknowledgement that her decision, celebrated by some of the media as a bold move, is in reality a precarious gamble, one that could unravel under the nation's highest court's examination. This isn't just about a ballot decision. It's about the integrity of our electoral process and the respect for legal boundaries. The fine print in her ruling isn't just a footnote, it's a stark reminder that in our republic, not even a secretary of state can unilaterally decide the fate of our democracy without accountability. The story matters because it underscores the critical balance between political actions and the rule of law, a balance we must vigilantly maintain to preserve the core values of our nation. Now, Angie will report on Seattle's removal of the BLM Memorial Garden in Cal Anderson Park, citing crime and lawlessness. Seattle's Black Lives Matter Memorial Garden, set up in Cal Anderson Park, has been removed by the city. Established during the 2020 BLM protests, the site became a hub for crime, drug use, and homelessness. The Washington Examiner notes that the garden was part of the Capitol Hill organized protest zone, known for its 24-day stint of lawlessness, violence, including shootings, and two homicides. Originally meant to honor the BLM movement, the park's condition worsened with vandalism, public drug use, and even a rodent infestation. Now the city's Parks and Recreation Department, with input from Black community leaders, plans a new commemorative garden. Journalist Jonathan Choi highlights attempts to revive the protest atmosphere, but notes even the homeless saw through the exploitation. Dive deeper, tap the link on our channel. Gary, get ready to break down Donald Trump Jr.'s unfiltered take on America's challenges in this latest triggered podcast episode. Tonight, we're diving into something you simply can't afford to miss in a world where the truth often gets masked by political correctness. One voice stands out for its fearless honesty. Donald Trump Jr. on his triggered podcast has delivered a message so raw and direct, it's sending shockwaves across the nation. And we're talking about a no-holds-barred take on the immigration crisis, the crumbling facade of sanctuary cities, 
and the dire need for real leadership in America. This isn't just another political commentary. It's a wake-up call for every American who cares about the future of our republic. Stay with us as we dissect Trump, Donald Trump Jr.'s words revealing the stark realities our country faces and the path that he proposes. And trust me, you'll want to hear our final thought on this. It's something that could change the way you see our nation's challenges. Now, before we jump on our special report, a quick word from our sponsors who make this crucial reporting possible. Just like the unfiltered truth we bring you daily, there's something else that's vital for our well-being, our health. Excess belly fat, the most dangerous kind, is like unchecked policies harming our nation's core. That's why I, along with many of you, turn to this groundbreaking new supplement. It's scientifically formulated to reduce fat storage, boost metabolism, and support weight management. And the best part? 51% off for the rest of the month. Don't wait until it's too late, just like our country's issues. Visit TrimWithGary.com. That's TrimWithGary.com. The link is in the description. Now, tonight we're peeling back the layers of a narrative that the mainstream media often glosses over. In a recent episode of Triggered Podcast, Donald Trump Jr. didn't just speak. He delivered a hard-hitting message that resonates with the core of America's current struggles. It's a message that many of you have been waiting to hear, one that addresses the issues head-on without sugarcoating that we're used to. Now let's take a look at what Trump Jr. had to say. This isn't just another political rant. It's a deep dive into the realities that are shaping our nation's future. Take a look. We have to start calling this stuff out. Crackheads are doing great while the rest of the country is being destroyed. He doesn't care that hospitals are being overwhelmed with illegals, that schools are struggling to keep up with students who can't speak English, that schools are teaching classes in other languages because that's where the majority of their students come from these days and they have no interest in actually assimilating or learning English. But then again, it may be good that he stays as far away from Washington as possible. You know, I think most people would have a problem if the president was gone four out of 10 days. In Joe Biden's presidency, 40% of his time has been spent on vacation. Minor details, folks, who cares? The Democrat mayor of Eagle Pass was on CNN, Eagle Pass, Texas, saying that Biden is ignoring his border town. Watch and see for yourself. Here in Eagle Pass, we've been getting slammed with two to 3,000 people a day, and it's just a, an unfair, unethical situation. What's going on here in Eagle Pass, we feel ignored by the federal government. The migrant crisis extends all throughout the country. Every state is a border state. Every state is suffering from it. Every state is being overwhelmed. Every taxpayer in those states is funding not just them, and their stuff, but a whole slew of illegal immigrants. You have the privilege of paying for yourself as well as millions of other new dependents, many of whom will never add anything to the system that they are happy to take from. Even New York City Mayor Eric Adams says that New York is at a breaking point. New York's at a breaking point, folks. They had, what was it, I think 3,700 new immigrants this week? 3,700. Think of the millions that are coming into Texas. The hundreds of thousands that are coming into Arizona. New York City, with a 12 million population, they're at a breaking point because of a few hundred? Imagine how others are feeling, Eric. Imagine this. I know you were really happy about being a sanctuary city for all these years. You touted it. You ran on it. Now, oh, it's a little different because that's what Democrats are. They want you to feel good about what they're doing. They try to make it easy. They don't care what they destroy in the process. They couldn't give a shit. But now he's singing a different tune. Listen for yourselves. Uh, the erosion of the quality of life that we've improved on in such a short period of time of this administration. And we have been impacted. Uh, for, for many uh, months, we were able to keep the visualization of this crisis from hitting our streets, but we have reached a breaking point. We're no longer able to do that because of the volume and numbers. Just last week, we had 3,900 people that arrived here. We are averaging anywhere from 2,500 to close to 4,000 a week. And if you do the math, you see that's 8,000 every two weeks, potentially 16,000 a month that we must feed, clothe, house, educate children, and all the services that you would give a normal adult. And we're seeing that play out on our streets of New York. 
And that is what the breaking point looks like, what we are experiencing right now. Huh. Huh. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what changed. Like, reality? Like, common sense? The stuff that everyone knew would happen? The reason all of these border states that have had to deal with these problems for years were so abject to these notions of sanctuary cities and laughed about it and made fun of these guys? Huh? It's almost like when everything we've been saying for years actually comes to fruition, the Democrats are shocked that their idiocy, that their fairy tale BS uh, doesn't work out the way anyone with half a brain knew it wouldn't work out. Hard to believe, folks. We're shocked. Though, to be clear, Even without a flood of illegal immigrants, New York is at a breaking point because of liberal politicians like Eric Adams. Breitbart reported today that the man who's accused of stabbing, okay, stabbing two teenagers in Grand Central Station on Christmas also yelled, and I quote, I want all the white people dead, close quote. He said that during the attack. On Christmas Day, he can stab two teenagers yelling, I want all the white people dead. And guess what, folks? Just to add a little icing onto the cake of incompetence, he was cut loose by a Bronx judge just weeks earlier, despite a long history of violent criminal activity. Think about that. You can do, you know, of course, uh, that's not racist because you can't say you want all the white people dead if you're black because you can't be racist if you're black, we're told, right? These are what they tell us every day. Even if you're saying stuff that if I said it towards any other minority, I'd be in jail. They'd find ways to prosecute me at the Hague for war crimes and hate crimes and all these other things. But no, if you're a 36-year-old, Stephen Hutchinson, who authorities say launched into an anti-white rant and knifed a 14-year-old girl and her 16-year-old sister who were simply visiting the city from Paraguay (laughs) with their family of all places, right? It's not just stabbing white people, he's stabbing Latin people now. Uh, He's been arrested over 17 times in the last two decades. Released, no problem, it's fine. It's fine. You can stab people with reckless abandon as long as it's in the name of hating white people. (laughs) Guys, there's a clear answer for this problem. It's putting my father back in the White House and stop coddling violent sociopath criminals. Just stop. We don't have to do this. No other country in the world coddles violent criminals. But this is what DEI, you know, the diversity, equity, inclusion, the race baiting, the fake racism, the created nonsense that's out there every day will get you. We keep doing it over and over again. It's Einstein's definition of insanity. Keep doing the same things over and over uh, while hoping to get a different result and then being shocked about why you do. Now let's break it down. Trump Jr. starts by tackling the immigration crisis, a topic that's become a central theme in American politics, yet so often misunderstood or misrepresented. He talks about the real impact of illegal immigration on local communities, overwhelm hospitals, schools struggling to accommodate non-English speaking students. It's not fear mongering. It's the reality that many American cities face daily. And he's not just giving a voice to the unheard. He's shining a light on the policies that have led us to this point. Then he moves on to the irony of sanctuary cities. These cities, once proud of their status, are now buckling under the pressure of their own policies. And he points out the stark consequences of decisions made more for ideological reasons than practical ones. It's a call for return to policies that prioritize the well-being and safety of American citizens, a theme that resonates with many of you who feel left behind by the current political system. But he doesn't stop there. He addresses the sensitive issues of race and crime, bringing to light a disturbing incident in New York. This isn't just about pointing fingers. It's about starting a conversation on the broader societal and judicial challenges that we face. His commentary challenges the narrative often pushed by the left, prompting a 
much needed discussion about the realities of crime and punishment in our society. Perhaps one of the most compelling parts of his message is his advocacy for his father's return to the White House. In his view, his father, Donald Trump, represents the kind of leadership that's missing in today's political landscape, a leader unafraid to tackle tough issues head on and put America first. This isn't just about political allegiance, it's about recognizing the need for a leader who can navigate the complexities of our times with strength and conviction. Don Jr.'s rhetorical style is as engaging as it is provocative. He speaks with a directness that's refreshing in an era of political correctness. His use of rhetorical questions and emphatic statements is a strategic choice designed to engage listeners and make them think critically about the issues at hand. This approach is effective in mobilizing support and creating a sense of solidarity among those who share his concerns. Now, the emotional appeal of Trump Jr.'s message is significant. He taps into the fears, frustrations, and hopes of many Americans offering not just a critique of the current state of affairs, but also a vision of what America could be. A vision that resonates with those who feel left behind by the current political system. Those who yearn for a return to policies that put their needs first. Donald Trump's junior segment on Triggered, the podcast, is more than just a commentary on current events. It's a rallying cry for a nation at a crossroads. It's a call to action for those who believe in the principles of law and order, the importance of strong leadership, and the need to address the challenges facing our nation head on. As we navigate these turbulent times, voices like Don Jr.'s are essential in shaping the discourse and guiding us towards a future that reflects the best of what America stands for. If you got value from this report, tap subscribe. And now it's time for my final thought. Now let's be clear. What Donald Trump Jr. has laid out isn't just a series of observations. It's a roadmap for the revival of our great nation. His words stand as a testament to the urgent need for a return to policies that put America and its citizens first. As we look towards the 2024 election, it is imperative that we rally behind the Trump family. The solution to our nation's woes, as Trump Jr. compellingly argues, lies in the leadership of his father, Donald Trump. His return to the White House represents more than just a political victory. It's a beacon of hope for millions of Americans who yearn for a leader unafraid to tackle the tough issues and stand up for the forgotten men and women in this country. Let's stand united in this cause for the future of our republic depends on it. The time to act is now. Let's make America great again. Now, Angie's next report, Nikki Haley, likened to John Kerry by a young attendee, highlighting the GOP's struggle with Trump loyalty. Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina and U.N. ambassador, faced an unexpected challenge at a recent event. A young attendee boldly compared Haley to John Kerry, known for his flip-flopping in the 2004 presidential campaign. The child questioned Haley's shifting stance on Donald Trump, echoing Chris Christie's comments about her inconsistency. You're basically the new John Kerry on the, do you remember John Kerry from 2004? The child asked, spotlighting the ongoing debate within the GOP about loyalty to Trump. Haley's journey into politics has seen her alternating between criticism and support for Trump, underscoring the Republican Party's struggle to balance individual beliefs with Trump's dominating influence. This incident reflects the party's internal conflicts and the challenges of political alignment. Dive deeper, tap the link on our channel. Gary, prepare to delve into President Trump's latest video, a throwback to 2016's patriotic fervor and its current impact. Tonight, I have something extraordinary for you. We're breaking away from the usual to bring you not just one, but two monumental videos that are reigniting the patriotic spirit across our great republic. The first, a dynamic three-minute journey, captures the essence of President Trump's unparalleled impact, reminiscent of the groundbreaking 2016 movement. But that is not all. We've got a second, even more powerful video that encapsulates the very soul of our nation's resilience and determination. These videos aren't just clips. They are beacons of hope and strength, rallying the American people to stand tall. It's crucial that you share this special report, spread the word, and let this message resonate far and wide. The time is now to energize the base and reignite the flame of American greatness. Stay with me, because you definitely don't want to miss my final thought on why these videos are pivotal for our future. Now, before we dive deeper in our special report, let's take a moment to see the robust, hard-hitting news we deliver is made possible by our incredible sponsors. Just like the resilience and enduring spirit of President Trump, 
And speaking of enduring, let's talk about enduring youthfulness. In our search for the proverbial fountain of youth, akin to our quest for unyielding patriotism, we found something remarkable. It is a special type of collagen, far surpassing the usual anti-aging products in maintaining skin elasticity and promoting a youthful glow. Hmm? <laughs> With thousands of ecstatic viewers, reviewers, its effectiveness is undeniable. Now you can seize this opportunity by getting a 53% discount and exclusive bonuses at healthwithgary.com. It's linked down in the description. Don't wait. Rejuvenate your spirit and appearance today. Now, tonight we step away from the customary news cycle to share something truly inspiring, something that transcends the ordinary and speaks directly to the heart of every American who believes in the vision and spirit of what this great republic stands for. As a staunch supporter of the MAGA movement and a believer in the principles that President Donald Trump champions, it's my privilege to present to you a piece of media that doesn't just inform, it inspires. In a world where the media often dwells on the negative, it's refreshing to witness content that uplifts and energizes. This is precisely what the first video we're about to show you does. It's not just a video, it's a three-minute encapsulation of the fervor and passion that swept the nation in 2016. It reminds us of the wave of change and hope that President Trump brought with him. This clip created by the Dilly meme team is more than a montage of moments to testament to the unwavering spirit of the American people. Take a look. For those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I'll bring back Trump. I'm 2024, everybody. I'm going to vote for Trump. I'm definitely voting for Donald Trump. I'm going to have to go for Trump. Who are you going for? Trump! As you've just seen, the video is a powerful reminder of the enthusiasm and commitment that President Trump has always inspired. 
It's not just about the political triumphs, it's about the emotional resonance that his leadership brings to millions of Americans. The clip shows us not only what has been achieved, but also what can be accomplished when a nation rallies behind a leader who genuinely believes in its greatness. Now let's turn our attention to the second video, a piece that might even surpass the first in its impact and importance. This clip embodies the true spirit of perseverance and determination that defines the American ethos. It's a stark reminder of what it means to stand firm in the face of adversity, to hold true to one's beliefs despite the relentless waves of opposition and criticism. President Trump throughout his tenure and even now stands as such a symbol of resilience. This video captures that essence, the indomitable spirit that refuses to yield to the cynicism and skepticism of the times. Watch. Years from now, some of them may look back and ask themselves whether they've made the right choice, whether they've made the most of the opportunities they've been given. Together, we have the same mission. Over the course of your life, you will find that things are not always fair. You will find that things happen to you that you do not deserve and that are not always warranted. But you have to put your head down and fight, fight, fight. Never, ever, ever give up. Don't give in, don't back down, and never stop doing what you know is right. Nothing worth doing ever, ever, ever came easy. And the more righteous your fight, the more opposition that you will face. In your hearts are inscribed the values of service, sacrifice, and devotion. Now you must go forth into the world and turn your hopes and dreams into action. America has always been the land of dreams because America is a nation of true believers. When the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, they prayed. When the founders wrote the Declaration of Independence, they invoked our Creator four times. Because in America, we don't worship government, we worship God. It is why our currency proudly declares in God we trust. And it's why we proudly proclaim that we are one nation under God. The story of America is the story of an adventure that began with deep faith, big dreams, and humble beginnings. The next generation of American leaders never, ever give up. There'll be times in your life you'll want to quit, never quit. Never stop fighting for what you believe in and for the people who care about you. Carry yourself with dignity and pride. Demand the best from yourself. The more people tell you it's not possible, that it can't be done, the more you should be absolutely determined to prove them wrong. Treat the word impossible as nothing more than motivation. Relish the opportunity to be an outsider. The more that a broken system tells you that you're wrong, the more certain you should be that you must keep pushing ahead. You must keep pushing forward. And always have the courage to be yourself. America is better when people put their faith into action. Pray to God and follow his teachings. Today, each of you begins a new chapter as well. When your story goes from here, it will be defined by your vision, your perseverance, and your grit. You will build a future where we have the courage to chase our dreams no matter what the cynics and the doubters have to say. You will have the confidence to speak the hopes in your hearts and to express the love that stirs your souls. As long as you have pride in your beliefs, courage in your convictions, and faith in God, then you will not 
fail. As long as America remains true to its values, loyal to its citizens, and devoted to its creator, then our best days are yet to come. May God bless the class of 2017. May God bless the United States of America. And I just want to let you know that God blesses you. And I want to just say, you are special in every way. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Witnessing these videos, it becomes clear why they're not just clips. They're a rallying cry for every American who values freedom, integrity, and the pursuit of greatness. They serve as a vivid reminder of the journey that we've been on and the path that we are set to continue. This is about more than just politics. It's about a cultural and spiritual renewal, a rekindling of the American dream that seemed to have dimmed in recent years. President Trump's leadership has been a beacon of hope for many. His policies, often misrepresented and misunderstood by the mainstream media, have been about uplifting the average American, about bringing back jobs, securing our borders, and ensuring that America remains a land of opportunity for all. His administration was marked by significant achievements, tax cuts, deregulation, historic peace agreements, and an unwavering stance against global adversities. But now, beyond these tangible achievements lies the intangible yet equally powerful impact he's had on the American psyche. Trump's presidency reawakened a sense of pride and national identity that many felt was being eroded. His straightforward, no-nonsense approach resonated with millions who were tired of the political doublespeak and the elitist attitudes of Washington insiders. He spoke to the heart of the working American, the forgotten men and women who felt left behind by a rapidly globalizing world. The enthusiasm seen in these videos is not just nostalgia. It's a living, breathing movement that continues to grow. It's a movement rooted in the belief that America's best days are ahead, not behind. It's a movement fueled by the idea that every American, regardless of their background, has the right to live in a country that values their contribution, respects their voice, and upholds their freedoms. This movement embodied by President Trump is about taking back control from the entrenched political class and returning it to the people. It's about restoring the American dream and ensuring that it's accessible to every citizen. This is what these videos represent, a reminder of what has been accomplished and a beacon of what is still possible. As we reflect on these powerful messages, let's not forget the role that we all play in shaping the future of our nation. That is why it's crucial to share this report, to spread the message of hope and determination that these videos embody. It's not just about watching and feeling inspired, it's about acting on that inspiration, about taking that energy and challenging it into something positive. If you got value from this report, tap subscribe. And now, my final thought is next. As we come to the end of this special report, it is important to recognize the power of what we have just witnessed. These videos are more than mere compilations. They are a testament to the enduring spirit of the American people and the transformative leadership of President Trump. In a time when attacks on President Trump seem relentless, these videos serve as a beacon of hope, a reminder of the resilience and strength that define our great nation. So I urge you, share this video far and wide. Let it be a source of inspiration to those who may feel disheartened. Let it remind us all of what we are fighting for, a republic that embodies the true values of freedom, justice, and the American dream. And after watching, I want to hear from you. Comment with your thoughts, and let's keep this conversation going, for it is in our collective voices that the spirit of America truly resonates. Remember, together, we are unstoppable. 
Now, Angie will cover the Ethics Committee's probe into a certain representative for potential campaign finance law violations and conduct breaches. The House Committee on Ethics has launched an investigation into Representative Sheila Sherfless McCormick. This follows a referral from the Office of Congressional Ethics examining potential breaches in conduct and campaign finance law violations. Key issues include undisclosed information in House statements and possible unauthorized services for official duties. A bipartisan subcommittee is now digging into those accusations. A central point of the probe focuses on Sherfless McCormick's use of official funds for TV ads, potentially mixing official business with campaign content, a potential misuse of taxpayer dollars. Dive deeper, tap the link on our channel. Gary, we're heading to Ventura, California for a special report on the Rogue Wave incident and its unexpected political spin. Have we got a story for you? Picture this. A sunny day in Ventura, California suddenly turns into a scene straight out of a disaster movie. A rogue wave, monstrous in size, crashes into the coast, sweeping up everything in its path, including a truck and, unfortunately, several people. Now eight of them are in the hospital. But here's where it gets interesting, or should I say predictable. In the aftermath of this natural spectacle, some are already weaving this into a political tapestry with threads leading straight to, you guessed it, Trump and the Republicans. So how you ask? Well, that's where we're here and we're about to explore it. So stick around for the whole report because you don't want to miss my final thought on this. It's a perspective on why this story isn't just about a wave, but about the tidal wave of blame that follows. Now, Before we dive into our Ventura wave saga, let's talk about something equally groundbreaking. We're launching our biggest giveaway yet. It's huge, believe me. Now imagine this, the Vanish Holster, a real game changer, comfortable, versatile, and it fits 99% of handguns. Think of it like the sturdy seawall that should have been in Ventura, reliable and protective. Plus, it's got this incredible no stink material. And here is the best part. We are giving away a Jeep Gladiator and $25,000 in gold, all thanks to Vanish. So get your Vanish holster with my link below in the description for $40 off and 120,000 bonus entries in our giveaway. It ends December 31st. Now let's ride this wave of our, uh, ride this wave of our Ventura story. Pardon me. Now, in Ventura, California, a scene unfolded that could easily be mistaken for a Hollywood blockbuster, but this was no movie, a massive rogue wave. In an event described as unprecedented, it crashed into the coast, sweeping up a truck and sending eight people to the hospital. The power of nature was on full display, and the footage captured is nothing short of dramatic. See for yourself. Oh my god. Oh my god. Huh. Oh no. Anybody else in the glass? Are you hurt? Are you okay? 
unbelievable. Wow. But let's not get carried away by the spectacle and miss the underlying narrative that's quickly taking shape. In the wake of this natural disaster, some are already pointing fingers, and you won't believe where they're aiming straight at former President Trump and the Republican Party. Yes, you heard that right. A rogue wave in Ventura, and somehow it's being spun into a political issue. So let's break this down. The wave caused by, a far, by powerful cyclones over the northern Pacific was a natural phenomenon, a reminder of the sheer force of our planet. The National Weather Service has issued warnings about exceptionally dangerous conditions along the California coast, a rare event that hadn't been seen in many years. Ventura County saw waves so high that streets were flooded with debris several blocks inland. And this wasn't just a wave, it was a force of nature that commanded respect. Yet, in the aftermath, instead of focusing on the safety and recovery of those affected, some are using this event to push a political agenda. Same old song and dance. If there's a way to blame Trump and the GOP, why not take it? It's as if the wave itself had a political affiliation, an agenda to push. <laughs> but let's be clear. Waves don't vote, and they certainly don't follow party lines. And the incident wasn't without its lighter moments, though. Observers noted the physical exertion of the cameraman, who in their efforts to capture the unfolding events might have gotten more exercise than usual. The quality of the footage was likened to that of a movie highlighting the dramatic nature of the event. Some onlookers downplay the severity, joking about the water and the near-miss experiences of those caught in the event. It's a human reflection to find humor in the face of danger, a coping mechanism perhaps. But then there's the person casually walking in front of the seawall, blissfully unaware of the potential danger. This image has been likened to how Democrats view the Republican approach to climate change to stroll along and ignore the looming wave of consequences. It's an easy narrative to spin, but it oversimplifies and politicizes what is essentially a natural disaster. And of course, the climate change angle, it's a favorite talking point to the left, and this event was no exception. Why miss the opportunity to link a natural event to the grand narrative of environmental doom? Trump's policies and the Republican Party's stance on global warming? It's a convenient way to shift focus from the actual issue, a rare and powerful natural event, to a political blame game. The National Weather Service warnings were clear. Extreme risk of dangerous surf, life-threatening rip currents, and coastal flooding through the weekend. They advised people to stay out of the water, prepare for significant flooding, and avoid rocks and jetties near this water. Now, these warnings were about safety, not politics. Yet, in the world of partisan politics, even Mother Nature can escape being a pawn in the game of blame. Let's talk about the real issues here. The focus should be on the safety of those affected, the strength and unpredictability of nature, and the importance of heeding warnings from authorities. This isn't about Trump, the GOP, or any political party. It's about a community hit by a natural disaster and the steps needed to recover and prepare for future events. The incident in Ventura is a stark reminder of the power of nature and the need for preparedness. It's a call to respect the forces of our planet, to take warning seriously, and to focus on the safety and well-being of our communities. It's not time for political finger-pointing or blame games. It's time for unity, support, and action. Now, I want to remind you, if you got value from this report, tap subscribe. My final thought is next, and it's something every American needs to hear, beyond the waves and political spin. So let's reflect on what the Ventura wave incident truly signifies for us as Americans. This event isn't just a story about a natural disaster or a freak wave. It's a mirror reflecting the state of our national discourse. In a republic like ours, where diverse opinions and debate are the bedrock of our society, it's disheartening to see every event, natural or otherwise, twisted into a political blame game. The rush to politicize natural phenomena to find a scapegoat in a former president or political party detracts from the real issues at hand. Community safety preparedness, and the unpredictable power of nature. The story matters because it's, not, it's, it's a reminder that not everything is a political statement. Sometimes a wave is just a wave. As Americans, we should focus on what unites us in the face of adversity, not what divides us. Let's remember to look beyond the sensational headlines and political spin and focus on the core values that make our republic strong, unity, resilience, and a shared commitment to the common good. Now, Angie will report on Elon Musk removing the Disney Plus app from Tesla vehicles, a bold stance in his war against Disney. We've got the latest in the high-stakes corporate showdown between Elon Musk and the Walt Disney Company. In a move symbolizing his strong stance, Musk has removed the Disney Plus app from Tesla vehicles globally. This decision, as reported by the American Tribune, comes after Disney joined a group of advertisers to pull ad revenue 
from the social networking platform X, challenging Musk's principles on free speech. During the Deal Book conference, Musk directly confronted Disney CEO Bob Iger, expressing his refusal to be swayed by advertising pressure. Tesla owners who previously enjoyed Disney Plus while charging their cars now find this convenience revoked. Despite access through the Tesla screen browser, the direct app integration is gone, igniting debates among Tesla users. Dive deeper, tap the link on our channel. That is all the news I have for 2023. Happy New Year, everyone. Now Gary will make your voice heard in the comments section. Welcome to the comments section where your voices take center stage. Tonight we're diving into your reactions on our latest video, Nine-Year-Old Prodigy Annihilates Nikki Haley. You'll want to hear this savage takedown. Let's see what you, the people, have to say. First up, Timothy hits the nail on the head. Trump needs better quality working class people in government with him instead of career politicians who have America's back. Well, absolutely, Timothy. It's high time we had folks in power who truly understand and represent the American working class, not just the political elite who have been running the show for far too long. Next, we have Josephine, who declares, not buying what you're selling, Haley. Trump 2024. Well, Josephine, you're speaking for millions. The American people are tired of the same old political sales pitches. They want real change, and clearly, many believe Trump is the man to deliver it in 2024. Now, FFAS23 cuts right to the chase. Haley's a rhino, always was. My family's vote goes to Trump once again. I would never vote for Nikki Haley. Well, there's a growing sentiment that politicians like Haley don't truly represent conservative values. It's a strong statement about the direction many conservatives want for the future. And then, uh, I think it's NATO girl, NATO girl, raises an intriguing point, saying that, saying that she'd pardon him seems like a way to court MAGA if and when necessary. Well, that's a sharp observation. Are we seeing political opportunism at play here? Many of you seem to think so. And finally, DDNAK36 doesn't mince words. Haley has no chance of becoming the next president of the United States ever. First, she's a woman who will govern with her emotions, and two, she is a rhino. Well, your comment reflects a skepticism shared by many viewers. There's a belief that Haley lacks the leadership qualities many Americans are looking for in their president, compounded by doubts about her political alignment. Well, your comments are a clear indication of the pulse of our audience. The message is loud and clear. Authenticity, true conservative values, and leadership that resonate with the American people are what is demanded. This has been the comments section on N3 Primetime. Keep those comments coming and let your voices be heard. Now I'll see who we're looking at tonight. Tonight on Looking at You on N3 Primetime, we're turning our focus to the main Secretary of State, Shayna Bellows, a name you've probably heard recently, and here's why you should know more about her. A video from 2021 has surfaced showing Bellows' discussion of election sabotage and mentioning the involvement of organizations like the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center in efforts to keep Trump off the ballots in key states. Now, this isn't just idle chatter. It's crucial because Maine, a state where electoral votes are split, is a battleground that Trump won a vote in both 2016 and 2022. And Bellows, who notably isn't a lawyer, made a bold move barring Trump from the 2024 ballot in Maine. She cited the 14th Amendment, Section 3, about disqualifying public officials engaged in insurrection or rebellion. Yet Trump hasn't been charged with such offenses. Still, she declared Trump's primary petition invalid. Watch this clip. And uh, Secretary Bellows would love to hear about your thoughts on like our biggest threats facing uh, our democracy at this point in time. Well, what Secretary Griswold just said and named is something that was unimaginable two years ago or 10 years ago, and that is election sabotage. It is a crystal clear example of what's happening all across the country. So we need to organize to make sure we have better leaders in positions of power to fight back against that. Uh, Secretary Benson talked about uh, voter suppression, and that's something that when we started our careers at the ACLU and Southern Poverty Law Center, fighting back about systematic, structural 
voter oppression targeting specifically black and brown voters. It's rooted in white supremacy. That is something we have to continue to do work on. And Secretary Merrill talked about the For the People Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. We must have federal standards all across the country. And then finally, just to echo my colleagues, this is rooted in a deliberate camp and organized campaign to discourage people from participating in our democracy. It is an attack on our very democracy itself. Because when everyone participates, everything that we care about, social justice, climate justice, economic justice, we win. And those on the other side are trying to discourage people from participating. That's what this really is about. We have to fight back to protect our democracy, to protect everything. That's such a good Okay, Karen. Now, her comments in the video are telling. She'll be talks about organizing to ensure better leaders are in power to combat what she calls election sabotage. It's a significant statement given her position and the gravity of barring a major candidate from the ballot. So why does this matter to you, the American people, is about fairness and the integrity of electoral process in our republic when a state official openly discusses aligning with partisan organizations and making unilateral decisions affecting national elections? It raises serious questions, questions about impartiality, the role of outside groups in our elections, and how these decisions are made. In our republic, the integrity of the electoral process is paramount. It's not just about one election or a candidate, it's about ensuring that every vote and every voter is respected. And that's why we're keeping our eye on the main secretary bellows. And looking at you, we're not just watching, we are holding leaders accountable. As we wrap up our last show of 2023 and look forward to 2024, let's take a moment to reflect on what we've discussed tonight. We started with the stark reality of media bias in our border crisis coverage, revealing a troubling picture of selective reporting that shapes public opinion. This is not just about politics, it's about the truth and integrity in journalism that Americans rightfully expect and deserve. Then we delved into the drama in Maine, where former President Trump's ballot disqualification raises serious questions about political maneuvering and legal interpretation. It's a reminder of the delicate balance of our electoral system and the vigilance needed to maintain its integrity. Donald Trump Jr.'s unapologetic words on his podcast underscored the urgent issues facing our nation, from immigration to leadership. His message resonates with many Americans who feel unheard by the mainstream narrative. We also revisited the patriotic spirit of 2016 through President Trump's latest video, a powerful call to reignite passion and commitment in our nation. And in Ventura, California, a natural disaster became a political talking point, a concerning trend where even natural events are not sp spared from partisan spin. These stories matter because they reflect the challenges, tensions, and spirit of our nation. They remind us of the importance of staying informed, asking tough questions, and holding those in power accountable. So thank you for joining us on N3 Primetime tonight. Stay vigilant, stay informed, and most importantly, stay true to the values that make this country great. So that wraps up our show for the year. A big thank you to Angie for her insightful news briefs and to all of you for tuning in and engaging in our live chat. Angie and I wish you the best in the new year ahead. Your participation and telling your friends about us this past year makes our show what it is, a platform for honest, direct discussion about the issues that matter most to Americans. Now let's talk about something that should be on all of our minds, especially moving into the new year. The value of gold, it has soared past 2,000 an ounce, a clear indicator of our economic climate. Remember the 70s, the Iran hostage crisis, turmoil in the Middle East, cities in chaos, led to a dramatic increase in gold's value. Well, it's happening again as our national debt climbs alarmingly from $23 trillion in 2020 to a staggering $33 trillion now, gold's value mirrors these concerns, climbing over $2,000 an ounce. It's not just about numbers, it is a warning. As Donald Trump pointed out, Losing the U.S. dollar as the world standard could be our greatest defeat in two centuries. That's why I urge you to consider the Patriot Gold Group. Mention Next News for top-tier service from a team dedicated to protecting your financial future. They offer a no-fee-for-life IRA for qualifying rollovers into physical gold and silver, a secure choice in these uncertain times. Make it your New Year's resolution to get your finances in order. Call 888 888- 857-9437, that's the number on the screen, for our free investor guide. Remember, the Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer for seven years running. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Stay informed, stay vigilant, and keep standing up for what is right. Good night. We'll see you next year after some much-needed time off and reset for the year ahead. 
Have a happy, safe, and blessed new year. And don't worry, we'll be active on Elon Musk's X platform. So be sure to follow us there for the latest news and updates. Sunny love from everyone here at the Next News Network. Good night and have a happy new year.